and welcome to the fourth and final week of Understanding Containers. Taylor, do you notice anything different about your co-host? Yeah, you got new glasses this week. That's right, I did. Thank you very much for noticing. And I call them my George Romero glasses. Do you know who George Romero is? Yeah, yeah, famous uh, film director. That's right, behind things like Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Creep Show, one of my all-time favorites. Anyway, when I say that, people are like, I don't really, I've never seen George Romero, so I don't know what you're talking about. So let me just do this for a second. Do you understand Are you going to switch now? to a picture of him pretty soon? Or? <laughs> um. There it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you understand why they? I call them my George Romero glasses now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's great. But that's not what we're here to talk about in week four. What we're here to talk about is actually Taylor... You know, against my better judgment and against all I could, don't do it. He's going to go on a tour, a speed tour of getting three applications up and running and reclaim cloud all on containers in less than 40 minutes. Do you think he can do it? I'm not so sure, but I'm going <laughs> to turn it over to the master himself and see what he can do. We're going to try it out. We're going to try it out. So um, just as a recap of where we're at, you probably have NextCloud running with HTTPS and such. Um, if you want to keep your NextCloud instance around, feel free to do so. I don't need this one, so I'm going to delete mine. But we, So my point is, for this session, we're not going to be doing anything with NextCloud. Um, I actually have another instance of NextCloud that I'm already using. So um, I don't need mine, so I'm going to delete it just so I have a fresh demo environment. Um, we are going to get three applications running today. One of them is called HedgeDoc, um, one of them is called BaseRow, and one of them is called WBO. And through that, we're gonna talk about tags in Docker, pulling updates, uh, bind mounts, which we've talked about but haven't used, um, looking at logs and how, how we do that, and the concept of a Docker file, um, which is, Honestly, pretty all of these things are pretty. I would say more advanced stuff for running things in Docker. So, um, but but I think the the best part is we're just going to run a couple things. You can kind of see that process start to finish of like, hey, I found a new application. I see it mentions it supports Docker. How do I run it in Docker? Um, I'm gonna uh, throw it again over to the the glossary. <laughs> Um, glossary. The, the we glossary, need a glossary cam. <laughs> yeah, the glossary may well be in its final form now, um, and I have added um, because I have added uh, a page on the Docker file, which we'll we'll get to, and images and tags, which we'll get to pretty soon. Um, so we'll we'll return to that, but you know, the Docker file. Sorry, the uh, the glossary is uh, is here, and it's got new stuff for you. Um, so the yeah. first thing I'm going to do to get three, um, <laughs> just to save time in this video, because I'm on, it's, I've only got 40 minutes. I'm going to make actually three different environments here. Um, you, I would recommend separating this out if you're going to follow along and try these three applications. I would recommend doing it in three environments just so you're sure that you have a clean space, basically. But I'll just say technically you could run one of these applications delete the folder or file that you are working in and you know start over and and keep using the same environment if you wanted to. I think it's simpler to just make a new one though personally, especially cuz then you can give it like a nice environment name. So, I'm going to for purposes of speed, I'm going to make all three of these at once and I'm going to give them kind of standard names here. So we're going to let that do its thing, and I'm going to go and make another one right away. <laughs> I'm glad gonna... you're feeling the, the, the press of time. Yes. Uh, you know. I'm, it's... I'm glad that we set that up right away. <laughs> TikTok, should I do it here? TikTok. Not the, app, not the application. I, I, not that TikTok. Not that the TikTok. The real original TikTok. The talk. The clock of the talk of the clock. So. Yeah, um, one one thing that is kind of cool, and I'll have to um, take us out of the picture for a second, but um, if you probably haven't needed much need for this before in Reclaim Cloud, but if you do what I just did for some reason, 
Um, you can queue up multiple tasks like this, and then you can go look at the the um, progress of them as they run right from this screen by clicking this little triangle. So that's it's just like a handy thing that I like to point out. Um, oh, oh, hey, George. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that guy's stealing some, you know, screen time from me. Yeah, yeah you know. Um, sure. He's truly a zombie. He's back from the dead. Um. Okay, so while this is going, we're gonna we're gonna go look at um, HedgeDoc first. So I've got uh, something bookmarked. Um, like I said, um, HedgeDoc is the first application we're gonna run. It's basically Google Docs for Markdown files. So it lets you write Markdown files collaboratively online, and it's really nice because you can uh, share them publicly from there too. So you can give like a you can make like a link and send it to somebody. It's a really nice little application. It's kind of like Etherpad, but for Markdown. So it you can actually have uh, formatting that you write in Markdown syntax. Um, so anyway, in he, in HedgeDoc's installation guide, um, they have a couple official installation methods. And the first one is Docker. So that's really cool. Um, they have some, hey, you need these requirements. You need Docker Compose. You need Git. You need docker 17.03 we have 19 already on our thing um, you'll notice here that the official docker images it says are available on quay.io if i click on that this is actually a container registry it's like docker hub but it's not docker hub so um, this is one of the times that we're going to pull a container not from docker hub which is kind of interesting and then below this they have a a uh, basic Docker Compose file that we can get started with. And um, you'll notice in here, it's actually got a separate database. So it's using Postgres for the database, which I'm not super familiar with. Um, and then it has the username and password set up there. I'm gonna wanna change that. That's not a secure password. Um, it sets a volume up for the database. That's cool. Um, it's going to have the, it's using Quay.io for its image. You can see here that that's where, that's how in Docker Compose you tell it not to look in Docker Hub. Um, and it's running using a couple environment variables. We've talked about this, but haven't used it a lot. Um, and these are basically configuration changes that you can pass to HedgeDoc right from this file, which is super cool. Um, it's using a volume for its uploads, which is like, I think where it's putting its images that you upload there. Um, it's defining a port here. We're gonna wanna change that to 80. Um, yeah, and I, I noted before that we're gonna wanna change this password here because that's really insecure. Um, but you'll also note, and this is kind of a tricky one, that that password also shows up here in the database URL uh, thing. So we'll need to change Whatever we change this to here, we got to put the same thing here. Otherwise, um, HedgeDoc won't be able to connect to the Yeah, that's that's a detail database. that when you did this, you wouldn't realize unless someone pointed it out. So thank you. Yeah, and it you know they kind of get around this by saying, and this is very common with Docker Compose stuff, is they'll say, here's a sample. For a production environment, you'll want to change it. But they don't really tell you what you'll want to change. A lot of times, the first thing you want to look at when people use that kind of language is passwords. Um, how do I make sure my password is secure? They might be talking about other things too, like in terms of sometimes when they use the word production, they're thinking of like a company selling access to HedgeDoc as a service. So that's very different than an individual in terms of traffic. We don't need to worry about that. But yeah, we do need to worry about the password here. So. Um, and the other thing I want to mention here is uh, it's going to, men, uh, I, I brought up the fact that there's environment variables for configuring. And if I go to the configuration page in this here, HedgeDoc has an amazing table of all of the options that you can pass to it. Um, and where they are, what they look like. So you can change things in the config file, which I honestly, I haven't looked enough at HedgeDoc to tell you where that file exists, but I'm sure we can find it. Or you can change it in the environment URL or environment variable, and it gives you that here. So these environment variables, that's where we know what can go in this section here, environment. Uh, and we will, uh, like, 
we we can use these to do all kinds of things. So you can set the um, the the URL that uh, it's running on. I I have already run a Hedgedoc instance for something else, and I've set things in there that allow you to um, use a free URL, which uh, is kind of like um, Etherpad, uh, where you can basically just make up a URL, visit it, and that's now a document. So that's that's an example of a setting. We'll we'll play with that a little bit. So to get started here, we're going to copy this compose file. And I'm going to go in my hedge doc environment that I just made, and they're all sitting here waiting for me. Um, and I'm actually going to need to go into the config area. Um, and so I'll go in the root folder, which is the, um, the home folder of the user that we're running as. But it, technically, this could be anywhere. Um, it's just handy to make to organize it this way, I think. I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call it hedge doc, just so I have a place to work from. Um, and I'm going to make a new file, call it docker compose.yml. Open it. And I'm going to paste in their example. So the first thing I mentioned is that we're going to want to change that password. So I'm going to um, just make up a password, turtles tumble tenaciously. There we go. That's good enough for now. I'm going to copy that and also put it in this other spot where it wants the password. Great. Can I ask you about that password? Does it have any significance for you? I always, when I make up passwords, I like to do alliterations when they're not. I'll say my like bank password, a little more complicated than that. Okay, <laughs> but, <good>. um, <laughs> but I I like alliteration passwords, so um, I usually like to use that. Um, Turtles tumble tenacious. Otherwise, like if I was like, if I was to tell you like, hey, use uh, make up three word, make up a password using three words. If you don't give yourself like a limit, it's hard to do that, right? You're like, I don't know what three words. Like, um, so <laughs> <laughs> limiting myself to an alliteration helps the creative process. It, it reminds me of the Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtle. So there's a little bit of that going on. Yeah, for sure. Donatello. That's where Turtles comes from because I'm playing uh, uh, the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game right now. Not right okay. now. That would be an amazing feat of multitasking. No. But <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, so it says command domain. We probably need to change this for our environment to work long term. Um, it, basically, if you're going to map a domain, you put this there. I can tell you from experience that it's going to affect the links it makes when you like click on them. We're just going to leave this for right now. I want to do the bare minimum to get this working. Um, and we're going to put uh, port 80 in instead of port uh, 3000, just to make sure we can load it properly. Um, yeah, so let's try that out. Oh, one more thing I'm going to demonstrate here. I'm actually going to pull an old version of this application. So this gets a new, uh, a new concept for us, and this is called a tag. You can see here it says the image we're pulling for HedgeDoc is quay.io slash HedgeDoc slash HedgeDoc colon 1.9.3. This is what's called a Docker tag, and it's essentially just a, a version, basically. So um, if I go over to our glossary, um, one thing I realized I never actually defined, I've been throwing this word around, is an image. So we we there's a when we run a container, right? That's a Docker container. An image is just essentially the what gets uploaded to a registry to allow your server to make to run a container. So it's it's basically just the name for that. I kind of it, there's a lot more technical complexity to it than that. Most of which I don't understand. But you can kind of think of it like Meteor versus Meteorite. It's like, eh, for our purposes, it's the same thing. But once it enters the Reclaim Cloud atmosphere, it's called a container now. Um, so um, containers, basically, when you're running a container, it's built from an image that you run from the registry. Um, so yeah. Um, and then tags are a way for Docker to keep track of images and basically versions. So if you don't specify a tag, and again, the tag is this colon and whatever comes after the colon in, uh, in the image section here, 
um, it will pull the latest version every single time you pull the image. This is good. It can be, honestly, a lot of times it's what you want, but um, it can be dangerous. Like if, if, you, if you're not comfortable with your application automatically updating all the time, um, or every time you pull updates via Docker, um, you might not want that. In their particular example for HedgeDoc, they're, they're specifying manually that it was 1.9.4. I'm gonna take advantage of this fact um, to actually pull an old version just so we can show how updates work in Docker because we really haven't updated anything yet. Um, so I'm going to tell it to do 1.9.3. Hopefully that's fine. <laughs> um, so now that I've got that file set up, I'm going to go into our terminal and go into the hedge doc folder that I made and I'm going to run my docker compose up dash D and it's pulling in some containers. That's cool, or it's pulling images, sorry. You can see here it's using 1.9.3. The interesting thing about tags is that tags aren't always numbers. Um, you can, developers can give tags to all kinds of images. So sometimes you'll, you'll on like Docker Hub, you'll see the tags available for a container are specific version numbers like this, but also things like beta and stable and that will say oh this will always be uh this tag will always apply to images that are on our testing area so they're tagged with beta um, so basically my my point being you do have to look at the documentation to see what the tags the developer has defined are because they aren't always going to be numbers they are they can be whatever they want they could theoretically name them like we name hurricanes every single time they do a release um, that's, you know, you can just give it a first name. It tags or whatever the developer puts in there. Um, so that's running. Um, and let's see if it's working. Okay, so I clicked on the URL here and it looks like it's kind of working. It's kind of busted because I'm guessing there's, um, I need to probably fill in that uh, domain um, field in our, um, Docker compose file. So I'll do that in a second. Um, but we're also going to try updating here too. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back to my compose file, which I still have open over here. So I'm going to change this to 1.9.4. And I am also going to go and set the command, the domain field. And I'm just going to copy the Reclaim Cloud one. get rid of the slashes and HTTP around it. Let's try that. Um, okay, so two, uh, two things we did there, right? We changed an environment variable and we changed the tag. So first thing we need to do to make our changes happen is take the whole stack down and we're going to pull an update. Now this is in the, the glossary, this command, um, but we're going to do a docker compose pull. And that's just going to go and check that there are, um, that it has the correct um, image for the container. So you'll notice that it basically looked at database and said, I'm done. And then it did some work on app. And that's because in our compose file, the app section is what we just changed here for the hedge doc. I should note too that, um, these services, um, you have to give them names in the compose file. Um, and these are really just for he like human readability. I could give these whatever name I wanted to. Um, so um, it, it is nice, um, I think, to know, to, to define it that way. But just note that if you're running in something in Docker Compose that you're writing yourself, you can name those whatever you want. Um, okay, so we pulled an update. And let's do an up. And it's not loading yet. Uh-oh. Oh, it's because I'm trying to load it over HTTPS. There we go. Still not working with, uh, there's no style coming in for some reason. Let me look at that really quick. 
page settings. Ah, I see. It's because um, it's trying to pull in a bunch of resources um, over HTTP, of course, because we haven't set up HTTPS yet. Um, but there must be some setting in HedgeDoc that says, hey, um, you have to load over HTTP. So I could um, I could look at HedgeDoc settings and see exactly what's going on there, or I could actually just turn on our built-in um, SSL in Reclaim Cloud. For the, the purposes of moving on, I'm going to, um, for this video, I'm gonna actually move on at this point because we do have the application running um, and working, um, but we would have to configure it yet, again, with these variables here. So um, we would need to get, uh, you know, HTTPS working. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a load balancer in front of this, just like we did um, before with our um, next cloud. And I'm going to return to this later so we can keep moving on. But that's one example of, of a Docker Compose file and how we uh, can pull updates. So can I ask you something while yeah. you move on? If you just did the shared load balancer um, SSL certificate, would that not be enough? It probably would be, um, but uh, I would have to have turned off the IP address yeah, that 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 also would have been another path here, but basically I'm uh, just doing it this way uh, because it's more similar to how we did the next cloud. It's a good example, though, for me, and I'll let you go on to your next one because I know we have you on a time limit mm -hmm. of how many of some of the issues you'll run into with any of these apps will be SSL related. Totally. Like it is a real thing. And like, don't let that beat you down because that is a balance between, you know, this actually application, like you said, is working. It's yes. just a matter of, of ensuring that you have SSL up if that's what it demands. And, and if it doesn't, it will look like it's broken. It's a big deal. And I, you know what? I should have even kind of talked through my troubleshooting here because I didn't really. I looked at this and go, hey, it's busted. This to me looks like a page that doesn't have CSS loading and probably other JavaScript too. Um, so what I did is I used the inspector. I'm in Firefox. It's called the same thing in Chrome. I think in, if you're using Safari, maybe use a different browser for this. Um, but there's a way to turn it on. I, I know. It's just not on by default in Safari. So then I went to the console, which is where you can see like errors and stuff. And you can see all of these red errors. And it says, content security policy. The pages settings block the loading of a resource at HTTP colon localhost, HTTP colon, hedge doc dot Taylor. So this is a real common thing that can happen if an application says, no, I must load over HTTPS, basically. Um, so that's, yeah, we can troubleshoot that further, but we're going to move on for, for the moment. Actually, let's, let's see here. If I refresh this page. Yeah, we're going to move on. I'll have to play with this a little bit more. And I'll probably update in Discord exactly uh, what you'll have to do. This is one of those situations where um, I have HedgeDoc running uh, already. So um, I'm missing a step here that I uh, would, by going too fast, I have to look through the documentation. Um, next one we're going to look at is base row, now that we got hedge, hedge lock, HedgeDoc running. So base row is, um, I've described it to Jim before as, uh, it's um, Microsoft Access for the 21st century. <laughs> and I ran the other way, just to be clear. I, I did run away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually think this thing's really cool. I want to, I, I don't know that I have a, a use for it at this moment, but um, I have used uh, something like it called Airtable, um, which it's just, hey, this is an, a database, like a no code database. Um, and you can make like forms that put data into it. Um, and because it's a database and not a spreadsheet, you can put other types of data in here. So you can see in their example here that they've got like some text, obviously. Um, they have like a star rating, a checkbox, images, and, and file uploads. So you can do more than a typical spreadsheet. Um, and you can also make multiple views into it because it's a database. And, um, so 
there's a lot of things like it now. Airtable, Microsoft Access is probably the most famous thing like this. Um, but uh, Airtable is a online version, and BaseRow is also an online version, and it's open source, which is really cool. So we're going to try to run it. I went to their documentation, and they have a official install with Docker Compose options. So we're going to we're going to go that direction. Um, this one, um, a couple things in here. So looking at their sample, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, it's pretty simple. It just has, it's just pulling a container. You'll notice that it's also using a tag here, 1.10.2. Okay, fine. Um, it's got a public URL um, defined as localhost. We, we may need to change that to um, be uh, the Reclaim Cloud uh, URL. It's mapping some ports, that makes sense. And it's using a volume for base row data. So it's making a volume and saying, this is where our data for base row is gonna go, fine. We're gonna actually change that and do a bind mount. And I'm gonna show you basically what a bind mount is and why you may want to use it for certain things. So I'm gonna copy their example here and I will go over to my base uh, row container. And um, I forgot I got to open the config manager, go into root. And I'm going to make myself a base row folder. Again, I know I keep doing this this way. And I keep saying, I'm doing this for organizational purposes. I think this is going to make even more sense when we use bind mounts here in a second. You probably be like, "Why are you making a folder just to put one file in it?" This is why. Um, <laughs> is is when you have other more than one file, it's especially handy. So I'm going to make our Docker Compose file. I'm going to paste in their example. Um, it looks like we don't have to set any passwords or anything. It must have its own built-in database or something like that or maybe it just doesn't need one. And I'm gonna um, copy my Reclaim Cloud URL here, um, change that from localhost, the duplicate here. Okay. And we will also change this to be a bind mount instead of a volume. So if you remember in the glossary, um, a volume stores its data in a specific place, whereas a bind mount, you can choose where it stores the data, um, which is really handy, again, for for organization purposes and maybe for backup. It's, it's super nice when you come back to an application and everything you need to look at is in one place, in my opinion, because often when I'm looking at something I'm running in Docker, it just kind of does its thing, and I may come back to it months or a year or years later and be like, all right, how did I set this thing up? It's really nice when it's all right there for me to look at. Um, so we're gonna define a path in the Reclaim Cloud node where it's going to store its data. And this is actually pretty easy to do, but I just wanted to mention that, um, that that's why, that's what we're doing here. So instead of uh, a volume, we have to give it a path on the left side of the colon here. And we could do this a lot of different ways. We could do slash, root slash base row data that would put it in the root folder under base row data we could put it in slash root slash base row because that's the name of the folder i made or we could do something even better which is a shortcut and we can just do a period and a slash and this means hey whatever path the docker compose file that we're running exists in put the base row data folder under that um, which is super handy. Um, so I do this all, all the time. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. Hit save, and then um, if I look here and do an ls and go into my base row folder I made, you can see there's only one file in this folder right now. But when I use a Docker compose up to, um, you know, pull the image and everything, when it's done with that, um, we can see we'll be able to see the the bind mount afterwards and this is a pretty big application so it's going would to you a liken bit. the bound mount the bind mount to a symlink it is similar um yeah if you're 
familiar with um, the Linuxy concept of sim links. Um, it, it's um, basically it's, basically it's a like a shortcut a for a, yeah. It's just yeah. a link for a place on your hard drive essentially. Um, and actually, I would I would view as volumes and bind mounts kind of like sim links because it's Got it. in the case of a volume, it's saying let's take the data from this container and kind of sim link it into this specific place that Docker controls and owns. And that's var lib Docker volumes. Whereas a bind mount is saying, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take this place in the container and sim link it to a place that you define as a user. And there are reasons why you might wanna do one or the other. To be perfectly honest, I just kinda of go with whatever they're using in their examples most of the time, unless I have a good reason not to. Um, uh, there's one example that I've done recently with our ghost installer in the marketplace where I use bind mounts there because I like the idea of having ghosts whole file system of images and themes and stuff like that being right next to your Docker compose file so that if you needed to make a backup, you could just zip up the whole folder and there you go. You could theoretically zip up that folder and this is gonna be the same thing with base row by the way. You could theoretically zip up this whole base row folder, download it, and then make a new reclaim cl cloud environment, upload your zip, unzip it, and then run the Docker thing. And you'd theoretically be good to go because it would have your Docker compose file that that defines the environment and all your settings, and then your base row data folder, which is whatever base row needs to run. So that's a super handy method, I think. Um, and kind of like, um, to me, like a really understandable way of handling the data, basically. Um, so uh, now if I ls here, you'll notice that now it made a base row data folder. And if I go over, over our config manager and refresh, we can see it there too. And if I go inside of here, I can see that it made a whole bunch of stuff. It looks like it's using Postgres and it's got a folder for that and Redis, which is another thing I've heard of, but I don't understand or know what it is really. I think it's a database too, so I'm not really sure why both of those are there. Um, media folder, uh, environment, caddy, I've heard of caddy, don't know what it is, and a backups folder. So, you know, maybe this is a lot of stuff that I don't need at this very moment in time, but you never know, if you're running base row for years and you're looking at their documentation on how to restore from a backup, it might go, hey, there's a backups folder and there's the files you need in there. Great, so now you have them accessible to you and they're in your base row folder right next to your compose file. So it should be really easy to find. That's why I like bind mounts so much, um, but you know, they're, they're only one way of doing things, the other way being volumes. Um, and I would always recommend when you're exploring a container for the fir or an image for the first time on Docker Hub to kind of go with their recommended path first and, and especially if you're having trouble getting something to work. Um, okay, so base row is running. Um, and if I pull up the URL, there we go, create a new account, bam. So I could sign up and Success. make my account. It smells so sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to make my account here really quick. I'm telling you, Microsoft unknown Access error. never looks so good. Yeah, it hasn't. <laughs> um, an unknown error has occurred. So this is a good opportunity to talk about logs um, and go. how do we look at logs. Um, so because I'm in my base row folder and there's a Docker compose file in here, I can run another command from our glossary. If I go to the handy command section, docker compose logs dash f. So basically this will let us look at um, all of the logging our container is doing. And the dash f means continue uh, following the log file basically. Um, if you've ever used the tail command, this is essentially like tail with the dash f flag, which just says, show me the logs, but don't quit. Keep reading the logs in case new things um, enter so you have to basically manually exit out of the logs but it's super handy if you're having uh, questions about something that's happening so if I do docker compose logs dash f there's a whole bunch of stuff that it spit out and it's saying hey I don't know what this means but okay great syncing base row templates okay fine 
Um, you've got all this stuff to work with. Um, so um, I could theoretically um, try this out here again. I'm sure this isn't going to work because I put the same password in. I'm guessing I don't have a complex enough password. If I put these things next to each other. If I look at my logs here, it says backend get API post. Oh, here's a bunch of stuff. Select leads. All kinds of stuff happening. Um, so I would have to look at this a little bit further. Um, I'm to be perfectly honest. I um, did try this out, of course, before recording. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Um, but um, one thing I could do is um, and when I tried it, I didn't modify the Docker Compose file to put our URL in. There's a lot of different things I could try here. So, um, But that's how I would look at the logs and troubleshoot from there is there's probably something hand, hand, uh, useful in there um, to figure out how to proceed from here. So that's another quick application running, need more configuration kind of deal. In the case of base row, I would want- Did I jinx you with the success <laughs> statement? <laughs> um, I, I don't know, probably not. <laughs> um, but in the case of base row, um, it, we uh, also have a bunch of environment files um, that we can look at to configure it further. Um, and in their, their case here, it says you can set these variables by using Docker Compose env file. Um, and this is basically another way to set environment variables that I don't personally use as often. Um, but basically, it's just a single file that has your environment variables defined in there. So we could do it that way as well. Um, and yeah, and then be good to go. Um, so I'm going to, uh, we'll return that one in a second. Um, or in a second to troubleshoot it a little bit later. I want, now want to go to our third example, which is WBO. Um, and WBO is a whiteboarding application. It's also collaborative. Um, and to be perfectly honest, this thing, it hasn't gotten updates in a long time. Um, so I just want to check it out. It's something I heard about like a couple weeks ago. I've had on my list to see how it is. I'm interested in whiteboarding applications that you can self-host, and there doesn't seem to be a ton of them. There are some, but this is one I had not heard of until recently that I want to try. And in their GitHub project, they have a Docker Compose file just hanging out. So I have very little information on this. I have, of course, tried it before this. <laughs> We're recording this here, but um, but you know, I don't I don't know a lot about it. Um, if I look at the compose file on the GitHub website, um, it looks relatively standard. You'll notice here that in a volume section, they have actually um, set up a um, a volume that's that this is a bind mount because they've defined a path, and we know that because there's a slashes in it basically. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So they're using a bind mount. Um, the weird thing is they're using a bind mount that is at slash opt slash app slash server dash data. So basically it's sim linking from a place in the container to a place in your node that's the same path in each place, which is kind of a non-standard way of doing it, but fine. There's no problem with that. Um, the only reason I say it's non-standard is a lot of times in Docker, it's nice to either put things in one folder like we've been doing or do it as a volume so you know it's in varlib Docker volumes. Um, so you kind of have one place where your data is. And this, this bind mount is actually just going to make it a folder at the root of your file system at slash opt slash app. Not the end of the world because if you look at your Docker compose file, you can see that that's what it's doing. Um, but I just wanted to note that this is kind of a strange one. The other one that is strange here is this has a build step. And this is not something we've done before, and it's also a less common thing. But basically, because this has this build command and it says the context is dot, which means it's looking for a particular file to tell it how to build the container. You'll note that this is because it, that this one does not have an image 
section. Most of our examples for Docker Compose have an image that it's pulling down. This one is not pulling down an image from a registry. So this is a very different kind of, of uh, Docker Compose setup. This is actually going to build a container based on some instructions in what's called a Docker file. Um, if I go to our glossary here, I have uh, a Docker file in here. And it, it's not real complicated, but it's basically just, it's a file that tells Docker how to make an image from scratch. I'm going to put that in quotes for a reason. And that's because usually when you're making, if you're a developer making Docker images, you're taking a base image that has Linux installed and then making some customizations to it. So a real common thing in a Docker file is to say, hey, use this operating system as a base, and then we're going to run these commands in there. Um, we're not going to go into the specifics of a Docker file or how to make your own because that that is very like on the developer end of stuff and it's not something that I've ever really needed to do to run applications um, that are, that exist out there that run in Docker. But I do want to note that that is one thing that you want to look out for because in this case, it's looking for a Docker file because of that build command. And if I go back to the GitHub repository, you'll note that there is a Docker file indeed here. So we will need both files, not just the Docker Compose, but we'll also need a Docker file. And all it's doing is saying, pull this image and run a couple commands and open some ports up. Okay, cool. So instead of manually copying and pasting like we have been doing, because we have more than one file here, I'm actually just going to uh, we're going to use git to clone the entire repository, um, which will include these two files. So this is a little different process. Um, I'm going to click on the code button, and I'm going to click the little copy here to get this link. And then if I go and reclaim cloud and to my WBO environment, I'm going to click on the terminal. And um, I'm going to run a git clone and then paste in that URL I just got. That apparently didn't actually copy. There we go. That was pretty quick. So now if I do another ls, I can see that there's a WBO folder. Let's go in there. And yeah, we're just going to run our Docker Compose um, command. So see what happens. Now this is going to take a little bit more time because it's not just downloading an image. It's downloading an image and running a bunch of uh, other steps. In this case, some stuff in Node. Um, so this will take, based on my last test of it, like a good minute or so. Um, so don't worry, um, it, you're not, you haven't done anything wrong if, if it's waiting a while here, not giving you a, not finishing up as fast as you think. So it's going to take a second. And Node is always like deprecated, get a new one, get this, you know, the gem file. I mean, I am, <laughs> I thinking, no, I'm thinking of Ruby, sorry. Um, Node 2, you're totally right. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I was playing with, I think it was, um. Uh, an application called Wax that runs in Ruby. And yeah, I, just... Gem Gem is like a dependency manager for for Ruby, um, and yeah. Node's dependency manager is called npm. And Node yeah. is famous for um, dependency hell, <laughs> in that like everything. And this is true of almost any pro project that is a programming project, which is like your code is dependent on other code. But um, basically, everything in Node is made up of tons of tiny little modules. So it has to go get those, and it has to do do all that. And it's very complex, and it's all it's kind of like a very fun, it's imagine a machine, a robot is building yeah. a house of cards. <laughs> 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 but it's a robot that knows what it's doing. You know, like it's a it's a well programmed robot. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to make any claims about Node. As someone who's not really a developer, I don't really know enough to say, like, 
what's good or bad because it does mean that the cool thing about Node is that people can get started doing really complicated things really quickly because they can easily build off others' work. Um, yeah. And it's not like the concept of dependencies is like only a node thing. It's every yeah. PHP, everything has dependencies. Um, so it's just that node is particularly famous for NPM having to pull in a lot of different tiny packages essentially to get things working. So it did its thing. Um, it says uh, it image for service WW was built because it did not already exist. Fine. Um, so yeah, so theoretically we're running here. Let me run a Docker PS. It says it's been up for a minute. Let's see if uh, WBO is working. There we go. Welcome to WB. And we got this beautiful Times New Roman font that you Look just love that. to see. And isn't it funny that this is the one that worked? Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, I haven't done anything yet, Jim. <laughs> That's true. All right, there we go. This is a test. Looks like it's loading this is something. A test. Here we go. Um, so, hey, it's a whiteboard. Wow. Um, so this is, mm -hmm. I'll say, maybe not the most polished application I've used, um, <laughs> but uh, it works. Um, it's got a beautiful default maroon color. Let's try green yeah, here. Like there we go. Yeah, um, we can, okay, I guess we can put text in here. Yeah, so this is one that probably um, by the nature of it being kind of a, I don't know what to do with this, um, but okay. By the nature of it being kind of a, a simpler project, it probably doesn't have a lot of configure out, configuration options that we need to get started with. It certainly doesn't care whether it's loaded over HTTPS or not, which is I think what we're running into with the other two applications. Um, but here you go. It's a good example. A of win's a win, something. right? Yeah. So I will we say, will take a win. I have. Um, um, we're gonna we're gonna take a second here and wrap up the video because we are at about 45, 40, 47 minutes. Um, but that is kind of our uh, gauntlet of, hey, I tried a yeah. few different applications. They're all a little bit different than Nextcloud in certain small ways. Um, I um, not in this video, but I will get um, those applications working because I can tell you that I have used all three of these before and they do work, um, but not in a way that I can show you within this limited time scope. So I will add that um, probably in the Discord of hey, if you want to, you know, go further with these other than just making them run, and you want to actually configure them in a way that you could make documents and things. Um, I'll have instructions on how to do that and what you might need to do. Um, but um, hopefully this was helpful as a kind of, you know, a peek behind the thought process of, all right, I've found an application. How do I get it working with only the knowledge that it supports Docker in some way? I like it a lot because it gives you A, exposure across various applications, B, an insight into binding um, versus volumes and what a bind mount looks like. See the Docker file when there's not, you know, you're not actually pulling in an image, like it's building it from scratch. Like that stuff, like as you were talking about, it really started to click for me. So there's a lot for people to learn by experimenting with these three applications. And that's week four. Yep. Experiment, see what you can get up. And then on Friday, we'll meet and talk about what worked and what didn't and why not. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention too is if you have an application that you want to try out, um, obviously go ahead and do that and please share your progress or struggle or whatever in Discord so we can all learn from it and I can maybe help you out with it if you have questions. Um, if you don't even know where to start with it, if you're like, here's a thing, I think it might work in Docker, but I don't actually know where to get started, just just post that in Discord because I'm looking for, I want to help some people get th some things running. So whether that's this week or, you know, if you're a little bit behind or you just have not have time this week, feel free to share that in our Understanding Containers channel or elsewhere in the Discord for that matter. Um, I, I, I want to, it's my goal to help people run things and do cool things. So if you have an application you want to run, let me know. We can, we can try to see if we can get that working.
Yeah. Thanks, Taylor. That's awesome. Week four, understanding containers. Big fan.